Well, good evening. There we go. Good evening. Good to have you back with us. Looks like it's going to be a little foggy this evening, too. Looks like it's just starting to form as we were coming in. Let's go ahead and open our songbooks this evening to number 510. 510. On Jordan's Stormy Banks. Five ten. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. We will rest in the fair and happy land by and by. Just across on the evergreen shore, sing the song of Moses and the Lamb by and by, and dwell with Jesus evermore. For all those wide extended plains, one eternal day, there God the Son. scatters night away. We will rest in the fair and happy land by and by, just across on the evergreen shore. Sing the song of Moses and the Lamb by and by, and dwell with Jesus evermore. When shall forever blessed when shall I see my father's face and in his bosom rest we will rest in the fair and happy land by and by just across on the evergreen shore sing the song of Moses and the Lamb by and by, and dwell with Jesus evermore. Filled with delight, my raptured soul would here no longer stay. Though Jordan's waves around me roll, fearless I'd launch a in the fair and happy land by and by just across on the evergreen shore sing the song of Moses and the lamb by and by and dwell with Jesus evermore you would let's stand for an opening prayer Loving Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the time and the opportunity that you have blessed us with to come together here as uh, a body of your children and to worship you and to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that as we go through this service, that all things that are said and done here and the praises that we uh, give to you from our lips are acceptable and pleasing in your sight. Father, we ask you to be with those who are unable to be with us tonight, uh, that whatever the cause may be, that it may be removed and they uh, once again take their rightful place amongst us here with the fold. Father, guide us, guard us, keep us always in your loving care. Forgive us when we sin, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Turn to number 231, 231. Two hundred thirty-one, Hilltops of Glory. 
Onward rejoicing, I tread life's way. Higher I'm climbing each passing day. Hilltops of glory now rise in view, where all shall be made new. Hilltops of glory I now can see. Oh, brother, won't you come go with me? Safe on the mountain I soon shall stand. Hilltops of glory land. Way down in Egypt, mid burning sand, Moses had started for Canaan's land. Never turn backward, always ascend onto the journey's end. Hilltops of glory I now can see. Oh, brother, won't you come go with me? Safe on the mountain I soon shall stand. Hilltops of glory land, footsteps of Jesus before us lead. We tread life's journey, his warnings heed. Evil allurements cannot prevail, I'm on the upward trail. Hilltops of glory I now can see. Oh, brother, won't you come go with me? Sink on the mountain I soon shall stand. Hilltops of glory land. Amen. Turn to number 485. 485. 485. O oh Lord, our Lord. Following this song, we'll have our prayer list. <clears throat> o oh Lord, our Lord. How excellent and mighty, how high and holy is thy wondrous name. Oh, how exalted is thy mighty glory, far up above and over the earth's domain. O Lord, our Lord, who dwelleth in the heaven, incline thine ear and hear my feeble plea. Help me to serve Thee till my work is finished. Then take me home, O oh Lord, to live with Thee. O oh Lord, our Lord, in mercy look upon me. I am unworthy. Tender love, O oh, Holy One, forgive me of my sinning and help me daily look to Thee above. Time we'll have our prayer list.
Would you pray with me? Our most holy Father, another glorious day that you have given us to be up and moving, to be around and visit with people, to be here, Father, and honor your name. As you look down upon us, Father, we ask that you be those on our prayer list. We lifted up names to you this morning, but we need to add Lisa and Bill Butts. They've been ill. We need to add Margie Cooper. She's been ill all week. She uh, has a doctor's appointment at Kaiser tomorrow. We ask you to continue to help Goldie Neal as she recovers. Tom Mills' his mother. John Buck, Eula Rhodes. We know that Eula is not having good days sometimes, and we pray that you're with her and guide her and her family and the things that need to be done. But be with Meredith Stand, uh, Standridge Shepherd as she has a surgery this week. Randy Kanzler with Joel Coppinger and his family, his, his mother Wilma has passed away. There was a celebration of life on the 21st at uh, Tulare. Be with them. Nancy Evans and Pam Munn, Sandra Hernandez and Betty Sandridge, David M. and Kalita Sisk and Moselle Curtis and Doug Sandridge, Gary Radcliffe, Linda Fry, Casey Case Jr. All of those that were in the path of that devastating uh, construct, uh, tornado, or the uh, cyclone that hit, tornado, uh, be with them as they gather around each other and are pray that they are left, uplifted and they have the help and the encouragement to uh, continue to rebuild their lives there. Be with our mission work always, Father. It's things that uh, need to be taken care of. We pray that the money that we send to them will help in that jurisdiction in which it, they belong. Guide us, Father, those that uh, are not with us tonight. We pray for them also that whatever is afflicting them, whatever is uh, not allowing them to be out tonight, the fog or illness or something else, we pray that we know about it and we can call them and offer help if we need. Always guide us, forgive us when we fall short, Father. We ask that you be with us the rest of this evening, the rest of this week to come. We pray all these favors in Christ your name. Amen. Amen. Turn to number 242. 242. <clears throat> How beautiful heaven must be. 242. We read of a place that's called heaven. It's made for the pure and the free. These truths in God's word he has given. How beautiful heaven must be. How beautiful heaven must be. Sweet home of the happy and free. Fair haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be. In heaven no drooping nor pining. No wishing for elsewhere to be. God's light is forever there shining. How beautiful heaven must be. 
How beautiful heaven must be, sweet home of the happy and free, fair haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be, pure waters of life there are flowing, and all who will drink may be free. Rare jewels of splendor are glowing. How beautiful heaven must be. How beautiful heaven must be. Sweet home of the happy and free. Fair haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be. Amen. Mark in your books number 529. 529 will be our song of invitation after our lesson this evening. <coughs> There are certainly times when I wish that the biblical record was a little bit more descriptive. For example, when we look at the life of Solomon in chapter 8, as we did last week, and he is praying that prayer of dedication for the newly built temple and praising God and acknowledging that though at the time it may have been one of, if not the most beautiful structures ever constructed, he realizes that it's nothing in comparison to God's actual splendor, to, to God's actual magnificence. I say this about the description because when we look at chapter 9, God gives Solomon a warning, as though he knows what is about to happen. It says that when Solomon had finished the building, the house of the Lord, and the king's house, and all that, all that Solomon desired to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time as he appeared to him at Gibeon. And he said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication which you have made before me. I have consecrated this house which you have built by putting my name there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. As for you, if you will walk before me as your father David walked in integrity of heart and uprightness, according to all that I have commanded you and will keep my statutes and my ordinances, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever, just as I promised to your father David, saying, You shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. But if you or your sons indeed turn away from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off all Israel from the land which I have given them, and the house which I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight, so Israel will become a proverb and a byword among all peoples. It's then in very rapid succession, at least in our biblical account. Chapter 9, we see the Queen of Sheba come and wonder at Solomon's wisdom and wealth. In chapter, in chapter 10 and verse 14, we see the beginnings of Solomon's problems as he disobeys the commands of God by hoarding gold, establishing military might, and establishing uh, a lot of things that he was not supposed to do, including taking all of those wives. And then it's in chapter 11 that it says that Solomon loved many foreign women, among, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women. From all the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, nor shall they associate with you. For they will surely turn your heart away after their gods. Solomon held a fast to these in love, held fast to these in love. He had seven hundred wives, princesses, and three hundred concubines, and his wife turned wives turned his heart away. I don't know what the succession, the 
We know that Solomon reigned for approximately 40 years. And so even, even with that, even if you put it to the extremes and say that the day he took the throne, he began to build the temple and it took a few years, it's still a pretty short amount of time between that and this. And it needs to stand as a warning because even as God warned Solomon, he then almost immediately, seemingly, began to do that which God said not to do. And not just a little bit, but with all of his gusto, with everything that he has. And in fact, it's that very action that led to the divided kingdom. As Solomon's choice in doing all of these things and having all of those wives and in allowing those wives to turn his hearts and allowing himself to be caught up in the worship of their pagan gods and even building some places of worship to them himself that God decided to take away those ten tribes from his hand. It's a scary thought, isn't it? How quickly things can change when we take our eyes off of that which we are supposed to. When we take our eyes off of God, when we forget what we are supposed to be doing, Solomon himself built the temple, watched the glory of God fill it. And not just within his lifetime, but within the span of maybe maybe 30, 40 years or less. We see this kind of abandonment of God and his ways. Disregard for his law. The wonderful thing about this, though, is that because it's Solomon, we don't actually have to wonder what he was thinking because he wrote it down in a book called Ecclesiastes. In the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon begins saying, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Solomon will then go on and explain that it was during these dark days, or maybe it's these dark days that led to what we see in chapter 11. But Solomon sought to fill his life with everything that life had to offer, and it led him to that conclusion that he leads this book with. That all that this world has to offer is empty. So what vanity means. Vain, empty, hollow. I don't know if you had them growing up, but I can remember getting those Easter bunnies, right? You thought, oh, it's a chocolate Easter bunny. And then you go to eat it, and it's hollow. And it's not even good chocolate, right? That's all life has to offer. Subpar chocolate that's hollow inside. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Solomon does not get despondent and just, he's not saying everything in the world is worthless. What he's saying is that trying to fill our lives with all of the things that Solomon himself did, as he says here, look at chapter 2 and verse 1 of the book of Ecclesiastes. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure, so enjoy yourself. And behold, it too was futility. He says, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to hold back. I'm going to let myself enjoy anything that I think is going to bring pleasure into my life. By the way, this theory of life will recycle itself into what we call today hedonism. And it's still rampant. He does the same thing in chapter 2 and verse 12. And he says... 
I turn to consider wisdom, madness, and folly. For what will the man do to come after the king except what he has already done? He says, okay, so pleasure wasn't it. Let's just try learning. That wasn't it either. He says, let me labor. Let me build things, right? We saw there that Solomon didn't just build his own house. He didn't just build the temple, but he built a lot of other structures. Building walls around Jerusalem and expanding the city itself. But he says even that wasn't it. And he goes on throughout this book and he talks about all of these things and he looks at the lives of people. He was an observer. He watched people. As only somebody like a king that has lots of free time can, right? And Solomon began to realize that this life just can't fulfill us, not in its own. He says he looked at people who were laboring, but then they died and they left it all behind. And it went to the hands of another. He says that's vanity. But he also saw that people found joy in working with their hands. And it was the realization that it wasn't necessarily the joy in building all of these things, but it was in being productive in general. And he kind of started to chip away at these things, and he begins to acknowledge that there are good things in this life, but it's never going to fulfill us because there's always going to be people wanting to take advantage. There's always going to be people trying to cheat the system. There's always going to be corruption, both in general people's lives and also in leadership and in the kings and all of these that rule and all of these types of things. And he comes down to it, and he realizes that all the money in the world, all the pleasures that that money can buy, all the wisdom that that can allow you to to seek after, all the learning that you can do, it doesn't mean anything if you don't have God. That was Solomon's final conclusion of the matter, as he puts it in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. A passage that I'm sure most of us are familiar with, as it's often quoted. Verse 13, The conclusion, when all has been heard, is fear God and keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. I can't help but think that Solomon could have saved himself a lot of heartache and a lot of grief if he just listened to the warnings of God given to him when he completed the building of the temple. When God told him this very thing himself. And I want you to consider this. I want you to think about this. Because it's a danger for all of us. It really is. Because remember, Solomon was not just a king. He was not just the son of a king. He was an inspired prophet himself. God spoke to Solomon. God answered prayers for Solomon. God miraculously endowed Solomon with gifts which Solomon turned his back on. Which Solomon saw as less valuable than all of the vanity that life had to offer, at least for a time. (laughs) 
Were it not for the book of Ecclesiastes, were it not especially for chapter 12 of the book of Ecclesiastes, I think Solomon's standing with God would be far more questionable. But I hope that Solomon listened to his own conclusion. Realized to an extent how much of his life he wasted. Right? I mean, we sing a song, right? Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. That's what Solomon did. He spent years in his own vanity and pride, trying to fill his life with that which God had already told him he needed. But he tried to do it his own way. Tried to figure out what was missing when God was there in the very building that he built. So we need to learn from Solomon. We need to listen to his words in the beginning of chapter 12 of the book of Ecclesiastes. Remember your, also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no delight in them. He says, don't be like me. Don't waste so much time and energy chasing after the wind. And so then as your life comes to a close, he says that you begin to hate the days. He says, look for God before that. This to me is the epitome of what Jesus means when he said in the Beatitude, blessed are those who mourn. Solomon is not talking about mourning the physical loss of loved ones who die. He's talking about mourning a wasted life. And so is Jesus. He's mourning those years of vanity. Years that he was not serving God in the ways that he should, and that's exactly what Jesus means as well. Solomon did a lot in his life. But I can't help but wonder how much more he would have done. When we look comparatively at the life of his father, David, and how much of David's life is contained in Scripture, it's not even close. As God touts the many deeds of David and, and touts him being a man after his own heart, and he speaks of all of these wonderful things that David did, yes, he speaks of some very bad things that David did as well, but Solomon seemingly, at least in Scripture, goes from building the temple to being called a pagan. One whose heart was led away from God. And then his life ends. And the book of Chronicles adds a little bit, but not really all that much. Now we can be thankful for at least some of Solomon's seeking after wisdom, because we have the book of Proverbs. <laughs> Because he also penned psalms like his father. But how much more? How much greater could Israel have been as a nation? How much greater could he have been as a king? If he had listened to the warnings of God from the beginning. He had everything laid out before him. He already possessed some natural wisdom in asking God for wisdom. 
but it would seem that that too was squandered. And this still happens today, right? People led astray by worldly influences, choosing pleasure over God, choosing money and wealth and fame and all of these things. Maybe like Solomon, they're, they're hoping for that last minute reprieval, but none of us are promised tomorrow. And that seems to be what Solomon is saying here in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 is that I'm glad that God gave me time to come to my senses. But don't be like me, just in case. And so as we strive to be the best leaders that we can, as we strive to be the best Christians, the best examples for our friends and family, neighbors, co-workers, people we meet on the street. We need to remember Solomon's life and the, the dangers and the follies that this world has to offer. Even as we've been looking at in our, our Bible class in John, right, when he says we cannot be in love with the world and in love with God at the same time. It does not work. Solomon is a prime example. I don't mean to take away, and I want to be clear about this, I'm not taking away from somebody who at the close of their life turns back to God. I'm all for it. And I'm glad that that happens. But we can't count on that. We can't count on having time to get right with God again. So we're better off just to stay right with him in the first place. Because I know I'm not as wise as Solomon. I'm certainly nowhere, nowhere as wealthy. But I also can look back at my life and know that there are times that I certainly feel as though I maybe I, I wasted time. That I wasted opportunities. And I don't really want the book of Ecclesiastes to be my book. I don't want in my later years, if God wills me to have them, to only look back at my life and go, well, that really didn't work out, did it? I'd rather learn from a wise man and his mistakes and try to do better. And maybe in that way we can be wiser than Solomon. And we can certainly do even greater things than building a temple even greater things than witnessing the glory on, in this life. Because if we walk with God in the ways that he has prescribed, we'll get to see the glory of God in heaven. And I promise you that that was a staggering day for Israel, but it is nothing. Nothing. Compared to what waits for us.
in eternity. And so let us remember the Lord. Let us teach others, as he says in verses 9 and 10. And let us fear God and keep his commandments. If we can help you tonight in your striving after God, in your seeking for a life that is not vain, but full. A life that does not result in regret, but in gladness and fulfillment. God wants that for you as well. And even as Solomon has pointed out, it is not found in pleasure or money or worldly knowledge. It is found in the knowledge, the comfort, and the relationship that we can forge with God. So if we can assist you in having that in any way today, please let us know how as we stand together and as we sing. Out of my bondage, sorrow, and night, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come, into thy freedom, gladness, and light. Jesus, I come to thee, out of my sickness, into thy health, out of my want and into thy wealth, out of my sin and into thyself, Jesus, I come to thee, out of my shameful failure and loss, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into the glorious gain of thy cross. Jesus, I come to thee out of earth's sorrows into thy balm, out of life's storms and into thy calm, out of distress to jubilant song, Jesus, I come to thee, out of unrest and arrogant pride, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come, into thy blessed will to abide. Jesus, I come to Thee, out of myself to dwell in Thy love, out of despair into rapture above. Upward for I on wings of a dove, Jesus, I come to Thee, out of the fear and dread of the tomb, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come, into the joy and light of thy home, Jesus, I come to thee, out of the depths of ruin when untold, into the peace of thy sheltering fold, ever thy glorious face to behold. Jesus, I come to thee. Please be seated. <coughs> Uh, 
Uh, does everyone have that wants to observe the supper have a cup? Let's go to our Father in prayer. Our Father, how thankful we are for your love, for your care, for your compassion and patience, that you sent your Son to take our sins upon himself and to be nailed on the cross for forgiveness of our sins. We now partake of this bread, which symbolizes his broken body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's now give thanks for the cup. Again, Father, we bow down before you in thanksgiving. Drinking this cup, which is a symbol of the new covenant, symbolizing the shed blood of thy son and his cleansing power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Just a couple of announcements before we're dismissed and some clarifications. Uh, this Wednesday evening will be Bible class, not Bible Bowl. So the Bible Bowl will be the 29th. So it's a week from Wednesday. I don't know why we had some things confused. So a week from Wednesday will be Bible Bowl, and the Bible Bowl will be numerals. Uh, let's remember that we have Bible class at 9.30 on Sunday evening, or Sunday morning, and uh, 10.30 uh, worship, and then uh, this coming Monday, the 27th week from Monday, the kids will be going back to camp for winter camp at YBC. Something I forgot to mention this morning too, um, I, I posted the new curriculum for uh, greeters. Um, it's in the back board. It's the same as last year. If you have any anything that needs to be changed, just let me know and I can make some changes regarding that. Is there anything else before we're dismissed? <coughs> Let's go to God in prayer. Dear God, we come to you now, Father. We're so thankful, Lord, for another time we can gather together to sing songs of praise, to do more from your word. We pray, Lord, that, you'll, that, we are, that you're with us this evening, that our hearts are open, that we'll learn the lessons from Solomon, that we'll, we'll not look to this world and its blessings, the physical blessings of this world, and the vain things that come with it. And we pray, Lord, that you'll Help us to open our eyes and our minds and our hearts to, to understand that it's you that allows us to have all these blessings and it is you, as long as we do your commandments, that you will bless us. Pray that you'll be with us the remainder of this week, that you will be with us in our travels, to keep us healthy and safe. And we're always, always thankful for the blessing of, of your son's blood that washes us from our sins and when we, when we fall short. Keep us healthy and safe until next time that we meet. In Christ we pray. Amen.